Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session. We're going to go ahead and get started. Please go ahead and find a seat. Um, we're going to be spending much of our hour in small groups, and that's why the tables have numbers on them. So we have a pretty packed hour ahead of us. So a key challenge for the three of us that are presenting this session is to stick to our script and to manage not only our time, but your time. So please note that the session is being recorded, and that's why we're using the microphones, even though we don't really need them for a room of this size. So we're very excited that you've joined us to learn a little bit about what's happening beyond Harvard. I'm going to kick us off with introductions and a session outline. Allison is going to re lead the small group analysis of models from other colleges and universities. I'll facilitate the reports back from each, school, each small group, and then Chris will provide some concluding remarks. First, some introductions. Chris Markman is, digital, is Director of Digital Learning and User Experience at the Harvard Library. In addition to the details in the conference program, I wanted to mention her teaching experiences at the University of Memphis and the University of Texas, Austin. Allison Pingree is Director of Professional Pedagogy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She has provided pedagogical support to faculty there for several years. Her connections across the national pod network were essential for our preparation for this session. I'm Anu Vedantam. I'm the Director of Learning and Teaching Services for the FAS Libraries. I joined Harvard a year ago, and my work for a decade each at the University of Pennsylvania and Stockton University have informed my contributions to this session. So the HILT conference explores many exciting activities across the Harvard landscape. Our session looks outside Harvard, which is a very big place. And trying to summarize it in an hour will be interesting. So we examine the question, how do other universities and colleges handle teaching evaluations? We noted that the instruments in use across the nation can be very blunt or they can be overly complex. Some practices include homegrown surveys, national instruments such as the IDEA, focus groups, interviews, peer observation, faculty self-evaluation, interfaculty sharing, narrative analysis, and student-led crowdsourcing. So what are some good practices happening elsewhere that could inform our work here? I'll start by noting that the topic of teaching evaluations is universally fraught with anxiety. So we corresponded with colleagues at several levels in a variety of institutions. In our conversations, we heard frustration, we heard nervousness about numbers, and several institutions discussed how they have recently changed their measurement instruments. So evaluations of teaching are not static, and institutions continuously review and adjust the instruments that they use, and also how they interpret the results. What you are hearing today is an analysis for September 2017, and next year there will be changes ahead. So just to say that this is as a moment in time. In addition to the formative impact where teaching evaluations data informs changes in teaching practice, we also heard about summative consequences for reappointment, for tenure, and for promotion. We also heard about the consequences of evaluative data for students making course selection decisions. And this was a topic that caused anxiety and controversy, and one where the perspectives of faculty, academic administrators, and students were pretty divergent. We heard concerns about who has access to what data at what time and how misunderstanding of data can really lead to some bad decisions. So we'll start by noting that there's a vast amount of literature in the education field on this topic. There is debate about the validity, the utility, and the advisability of various teaching evaluation mechanisms that are used for summative purposes. The end of course student ratings of instruction are especially a point of contention. We will not engage explicitly with this literature because we do not have the time to do it justice here. We welcome you to follow up with us if this topic is of interest, and we can provide some annotated bibliographies, because there really is a lot has, that has been written on the topic. Today, instead, we're going to ask you to engage in close reading of a few selected instruments. We're not endorsing these instruments. We offer them to you as raw material for your own reflection. 
These are examples and artifacts that may inform our work here at Harvard. A few common questions did emerge from our conversations with colleagues at the different institutions. Who gets to see the data? Do administrators see the data? Do they compare numbers across faculty, across disciplines, and across institutions? Do students get to analyze the data to make course choice decisions? And how do stakeholders express frustration with the instruments? So just some questions to keep in mind. I'm going to hand it over to Allison, who's going to guide us through our small group analysis of specific instruments. Great. Thank you, Anu. Wonderful to see you all. At your tables, you have two sets of documents. You have a worksheet in a paper clip. If you'll take that paper clip off and pass around the worksheets to everyone, one copy for each person at the table. As you can see from that worksheet, we're going to be spending time looking closely, as Anu mentioned, at some artifacts. Each table has a different institution from whose um, collection of materials we have shared with you a few bits of, uh, a few artifacts related to evaluation of teaching for summative purposes. So clarification about our focus here, we're not diving into teaching evaluation for formative purposes. This is higher stakes, decisions about promotion and tenure, student course selection. There's a lot to be said about formative um, feedback. That's not our focus. Um, what we're going to invite you to do in a moment is to open the envelope that's at your table and to take a look at, before, before you do, before you do, look with me at the, <laughs> look with me, I shouldn't have said that, that's just, that's just baiting you. So looking at the worksheet, you'll see there are four questions there for individual reflection. So we're going to ask you to take five minutes each uh, take five minutes um, to look at what's in the envelope and think about those four questions about with this artifact, with this instrument or this approach, what kind of information, what kind of data from whom is this approach engaging? What kinds of things does this model or approach assume that good teaching looks like? What kinds of institutional values or assumptions are being made here and what questions does this model or approach raise for you? Then, in groups, you'll talk about, in general, the pros and cons of this instrument or model. Please appoint a note taker and a reporter so that when we have our lightning round report outs of two minutes each, someone is prepared to stand up and say, here's what we saw as the pros and cons of this model or approach. As each table is talking about their approach or model, Chris will be showing those models on the document camera um, on the screen. We also have put together the complete collection of models um, as a PDF at a bit.ly link. And that way, all of you have access to all the materials that we got um, uh, from this, for this session, rather than making copies of every instrument for every person to look at. Not a good use of paper. So essentially, your task now is five minutes of individual reading and thinking and writing, 15 minutes of discussion at table to prepare for two-minute report outs on the questions on the worksheet. Any questions from you at this point? You'll see uh, in your envelopes what, what your uh, objects of study are. Go ahead and open. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on your marks, get set, go. Okay, because time is tight, we're going to encourage you as, as provisionally as you've been able to glance at the documents and start to make sense of them. There's a lot more you could do with that individually, but let's encourage you now to start to talk as a group about, in general, what, what did you notice here? What are the things that you think are particularly strong or useful about this approach? What are the things that you think are drawbacks or questions, puzzlements that you have? So kind of pro-con. And again, if you'll um, appoint someone to take notes and be prepared to report out, you can see the strengths and drawbacks um, area of the worksheet now to, to be focusing on. So go ahead and start talking as a group. We're going to wrap up the group conversations, finish whatever thought you're on. 
Please raise your hand if you are the designated reporter. Reporter, you're going to be prepared to speak. Just raise your hand so we make sure everybody knows what's happening. Who's going to report out over here? Over here. Yeah, got it. Great. We are so eager to hear what you guys have come up with. And I'm sure you're eager to hear about the other tables and models. As I said, all of the models are available on the bit.ly link that um, we've projected and will project again. For the time that we'll be analyzing a specific model, Chris is going to show a portion of it um, on the document camera. But there's a lot more information that we won't be able to show at a glance. So you'll be able to look at that later in the, in the bit.ly. OK, lightning round. I'm going to be timing. Uh, Anu's going to be facilitating. So I'm going to come table to table, two minutes per table. Of course. So um, we're going to go ahead and start. We have a very strict timeline. So in addition to managing my own time, I get to manage yours. So we're going to start with um, table one, which is in the far back. As we uh, take on each instrument, Chris will pull the instrument up on the document camera. And just to note that you have full access to all of them later, in case you really want to geek out on different types of surveys. Um, Allison is going to use the iPhone timer set at two minutes. So when it makes a loud sound, then that's time to wrap up. Our first model is Stanford University, table one in the far back. Tamara is our spokesperson. OK, so the first thing to know on this is that the first question is a customizable question based on learning goals. And we both thought that this is fantastic. Um, it emphasizes what the instructor thinks is most important. And it indicates a strong commitment to student learning. And that commitment to student learning is echoed in multiple questions. Um, however, we also felt that there are some potential drawbacks to both starting with the learning goals and having this be open-ended um, in that what if the learning goals aren't well designed? What if an instructor puts in learning goals that are just easy to reach for the sake of getting good feedback? Um, so we had a lot of questions about how that actually works. Um, we think it's fantastic that uh, this uh, survey has a lot of customizable questions, realizing that there's not just one size fits all for uh, teaching and learning. Um, and it also seemed like the interface would be easy to use uh, on the side of the faculty member who is, needs to do that customizing. Um, there are a number of formative questions that will give the instructor some feedback about how they can improve their course. Um, but on that note, um, we thought that there could be more specific open-ended questions about uh, ways to improve. Um, we noted that there, were no, there was no feedback about individual instructors. Um, let's see. Um, there was some kind of there was in, clearly uh, an emphasis on online education here, and that there's a question about what percentage of the class meetings did you attend online. But we thought that question could be challenging to interpret, um, and uh, we we would appreciate a question about prior knowledge. Um, what did the students bring into the class, and also where? How did this motivate them to take uh, further courses in this discipline? <laughs> Thank you, table one. You've set a very good model for the other tables to follow. Table two had North Carolina State. I'm pleased uh, to share your name also just before you give your wrap up. Okay, hi. My name is David Jennings. And yeah, like you said, we had North Carolina State. And this is a very comprehensive and uh, prescriptive uh, method of evaluation that we thought may be the case because it is a state school and not a private school. Um, but some strengths of it were that it was comprehensive, like I said. There's opportunities for students to rate, peers to rate, uh, instructors to discuss and self-rate themselves, and also uh, administrators to give a final review of a portfolio. And so that 360 approach we thought was good. Um, there's evaluation of the syllabus by both uh, students and peers. Uh, and very, it seemed, they seem to be very interested in the goals and objectives of the syllabus. There was uh, some vague terms, like they used the word appropriate a lot. Um, I think it's on the next page. But, and so they never really operationalized the term appropriate. Uh, so we saw some uh, room for maybe some political interference in some of this process. Uh, 
Um, we also thought that while it's a pro that it is prescriptive and measurable, uh, it may be too rigid for academic freedom, and so we maybe had some concerns about how this would work at a liberal arts institution. Um, so some things that we could adapt possibly. We liked the idea of syllabus standards at the department level. Uh, we also liked the idea of peer review among the department of goals and objectives in the syllabus and potentially a peer review committee as well as some even cross-departmental uh, collaboration like people who are maybe in a different school but are teaching a similar uh, discipline. <laughs> There's our timer, uh, but I think uh, we've covered a lot. And this particular document was also very long, so your table gets extra credit for having to do a lot of reading. Um, our third table is table three, taking on the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, if the person speaking could quickly give their name and then start. Hi, I'm Julia King. Um, this was an interesting one because um, if you flip the page over, the way the students um, saw the rankings of a course was almost like ratemyprofessor.com when they're picking their courses. And um, these numbers, we're not sure exactly how, but they came from the survey that was on the other side. Um, we thought the strengths were that it would take very little time to fill out the survey. Um, it's, it's, um, there's no survey fatigue because it was very simple to answer. <laughs> answer. Um, we, this could be a strength or a weakness that um, the first question was asking the quality of the course so it kind of gave someone an opportunity to just instinctively choose um, what they thought the quality was right off the bat without being asked some further questions. A few interesting things about this one is that it, in the description it says that um, questions 6 through 10 were recently added and the survey used to be just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and then 10, 11, and those, the original survey was very much based on quality, difficulty, and if you like the professor, and then the second set of questions that were added were much more about critical thinking and what you thought you gained from the class, did it help you? And um, we thought those questions were interesting because it um, kind of informed what they meant the other questions to, to ask, but they asked them more specifically. Um, let me look at my notes. Um, there was a comment that it, you know, it looks like a marketing tool to put this on a website with, for students instead of being something that actually professors could use to improve their course because they didn't have um, any direct feedback or comments from the students on how to do that. Perfect timing. Thank you so much. I think of, all, of the, all the different tables, this is the one that has quite a lot of student-created um, representations of the data that's collected. Our fourth table took on the University of Notre Dame over there. Please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Annika. And um, so these other um, schools, they've been looking at the specific survey instrument that was used. Um, this is kind of how professors are evaluated kind of overall for their teaching and consideration for tenure and advancement. And so we liked that they took a balanced approach. So feedback from students um, you can see this course instructor feedback. Um, we didn't have that instrument, but we think that's kind of the standardized survey um, of student perceptions. And that's balanced with um, feedback from peers um, because they acknowledge that um, students says the CIF ratings are incapable of revealing certain things about the quality of the teaching. Maybe the students don't uh, at this point understand exactly what the purpose of the course was or why a teacher did the way things they did. And so we like that they um, balance um, peer faculty review with that. Um, some things that were, were drawbacks, we thought um, we didn't have all the details of this survey, so we don't know exactly what was asked there. Some of the implementation of how this review takes place was unclear to us. Um, and uh, related to that, some of these things might be a little um, unclear to, uh, to faculty how this is actually taking place. Um, 
But we did like that it is flexible, dependent on departments and things like that, because each department teaching area may have different values in a different environment. So it's um, customizable to that. I think this is another one that has a lot of text. And it's also a fairly complex system. And, and all of the documents are in the bit.ly because there is quite a lot to read on this particular one. Thank you so much to the Notre Dame table. So we're halfway through our report backs. We have four more. Table five had the University of Texas. Please go ahead. Hi there. I'm Holly Gooding from the Med School. And we had a great representation from a lot of the Harvard schools here. So in some ways, I feel like we had the kind of classic end of course eval, which if you look up there, you will see. It's from the University of Texas at Austin. Some of the strengths are that right at the beginning in the very fine print that we suspect students may not read. It communicates the uh, high stakes of these this for faculty, um, <laughs> which is really interesting. People laugh, but I, I find when I talk to students, they often don't know that their evaluation makes a difference for promotion and whether people are invited back. So it clearly communicates that to the student, which is good. Um, it focuses on what we thought were some basic but very important things like the organization and the clarity and the fairness of the instructor. Um, so that's a strength because you have to have those things to get to some of these higher level things around curiosity and engagement and motivation. Um, but that leads us to some of the downsides, which is that there's very little about learning. It's all about how the instructor essentially organized and presented the material. Uh, it's also overly long. We were quite concerned that students would tire out and just put all fives, all twos, all threes. Um, in terms of just basic survey design, there, in addition to its length, there was no like reverse coding. So to make sure students are really reading as opposed to, again, just doing all one or the other. Um, and uh, yeah, but just a lot of concerns about the over focus on the instructor's organization and the lack uh, and the length and concern about the validity and reliability that would come from that. Yeah, thank you very much. That issue of people just marking all fives came up in a couple of our conversations. Okay, um, Three more uh, to look at. The next one, uh, the instrument itself is the IDEA instrument. And the example was Stockton University's use of this national instrument. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Jamus from uh, Academic Technology for the FAS. So uh, this is only the first page, by the way, uh, <laughs> of the survey. So it was really interesting. We had a discussion about, so one, one of the, the, the drawback right off the bat is the comprehensiveness, which is also a strength, you, you, you could say, but, um, and the format. Uh, it's a little daunting to see this. And again, there's a, a, a back page, a um, lot of multiple choice, but at the end, there are a few open-ended questions. However, when you actually start to look at the questions and the content, we felt for the most part that it seemed to hit all the right uh, points. Motivation of the students, how the instructor organized the class, um, um, sort of emphasis on, on you know, best practices, teaching technique, uh, collaborative group, hands-on teaching, use of technology. And also uh, focus on the personal development of the student. What was your motivation for taking this class? Um, uh, did you reach your goal? So um, our sense was that if you, if you can kind of overcome the initial maybe um, fear of seeing this you know, SAT-like uh, questionnaire, <laughs> then maybe you, you, you can actually get some valuable information uh, out of it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, two more to go. Table seven had the University of Minnesota. Hi. So um, the form that we had was a peer evaluation form. We're assuming they also have some sort of student evaluation that takes place, right? Um, and Matt, we had a researcher on our team too. Matt kindly looked up uh, how this is used. So it looks like it's part of the tenure and promotion process and they have a, this evaluation that happens pretty much every year as part of the evaluation of faculty. Um, so we thought that uh, something that really stood out was that this instrument really looks like it measures. So this is the, the more quantitative part. There are also two pages in the beginning that are based on um, that are based on a classroom observation, and um, we thought that it was a little bit concerning that it's it's not really set up in a way to pair it, objective evaluations of teaching along with the interpretations of those evaluations, and that that could lead to some 
what is it, political interference that someone brought up earlier, possibly, <laughs> or vague interpretations of what the terms actually mean being translated into you know, a positive or a negative evaluation that may not be justified. Um, we thought that the other, the other kind of problematic thing about this instrument is that it, it um, judges whether the faculty member is following their procedures or their protocols, and it doesn't really allow room for innovation or for taking advantage of something that might be pedagogically very useful. It, um, it's also not clear whether this is entirely respectful of faculty. That was one of the concerns that was brought up and, and how this is really used in the tenure and promotion process. There really isn't a lot of context guiding this document on the document itself, although there's a lot of information online, so maybe it is clear to faculty who participate. And um, yeah, overall, I think our, our major concern was that this seems much more to evaluate um, process rather than actual learning outcomes. And uh, we'd ideally, we think that there are a lot of strengths, but that was one of our big concerns. So that's interesting. We're talking about improv improvising versus being organized. I think, right. Is, um, so our last um, table had Dartmouth College. Um, and I think it was related to specifically chemistry. It's some of these instruments were for smaller subsets. We should mention that real quickly. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Anna Beaver from the Bach Center. Uh, we had Dartmouth. This evaluation is, uh, as you mentioned, from the uh, chemistry course. I don't know if it's more general. It's also from a, a summer course and from 2006. So I don't know if that remains, if it remains the standard. Um, so things we noticed, this is very close to Harvard's uh, Q guide in a lot of ways. I don't know whether it's a strength or a drawback. You can decide. Um, there were a few things that we thought were kind of pure unalloyed strengths. Most things actually we put in both columns. Um, so for example, this is a form that values very highly, puts a strong emphasis on student feedback on the effectiveness of teaching. And this gets at that question of whether these things are more like dining reviews, uh, in which everyone is by definition an authority on whether they enjoyed uh, their meal, or whether it's like a review of a surgeon, in which case you might not be an expert on whether they are a good, uh, a good surgeon. So it's a strength and weakness that it's asking students not only about their experience, but about whether they think the teaching was effective uh, for them. That's something that's hard for students to judge in the short term. Uh, we liked very much that it called for a lot of critical and qualitative feedback. It's not all just a Likert scale. Um, we liked uh, question 10 that uh, compels students to do some performance of metacognition. Um, it's a question about, sorry, I'm trying to find it here on the form. Oh, how did you contribute to your own learning uh, experience? And the whole survey actually starts with that. Right? It puts students back into the experience of their own learning and asks them what they brought to the course. Um, we think there could have been more of that, though, so that was a little bit in the weakness category, too. We thought there's a lot of apples to oranges comparison on the Likert scale. So what would it mean, for example, in question four, I think it is there, um, to say, I was engaged with the course material, I give it a three. Right? Doesn't that mean that you're not, not actually engaged? It's hard to measure that way. It was hard to see. There was a real jumble of questions here that might be of interest to institutional research that you can imagine the institution using and compiling and analyzing, but then a lot of questions that seemed almost to be aimed at the student's ongoing metacognition, right? Uh, down the road, did you learn anything from this, this course? Thank you so much, everybody, for paying, playing along with our two-minute limits. I'm going to go ahead and hand over the microphone to Chris, who's going to walk us through the wrap-up. Thank you, Anu. So what we'd like you to do now in our last around 10, 12 minutes is to look at your worksheet again and just think for a minute about the last two questions, now that you've had a chance to listen and see what everybody in the room did. And just think about what, if anything, that you heard or saw today might be useful to bring or adapt for use at Harvard, and then what would be some next steps. And so we'll give you a minute to think, and then I'm going to open it up for our general discussion. Okay, so we'd like to go ahead and open up the floor. If you have, so what, what might we do with this information here at Harvard? If you want to share, just raise your hand so Allison can bring you the microphone for the uh, videotape for posterity. Hi, Dean Eastwood from the School of Public Health. Um, we, we really like this exercise, so we congratulate you on the exercise. It was very easy to take someone else's instrument and critique it. Um, and I think um, we're in the process at the School of Public Health, and I know others are looking at their instruments and looking at the platforms. 
So I think this is a nice uh, starting point that we could critique a few others and then take a look at our own um, instruments, and we might get more out of that. The process itself as a tool to use. Wow. Great. Yeah, I thought the uh, Minnesota thing was pretty interesting. I know that they've been spending years there figuring out how to how the faculty help each other teach. And I actually understand that you might think it's disrespectful, but what if it had worked? Then, then it would be amazing. And I guess the business school does that already. Is that right? Yeah, so I think actually that's what we should do. Because all these other things look exactly like the Q guide. We could add a few things here or there. Nothing's very different. It, well, nothing's 20% different. <laughs> <laughs> Dina. Uh, so uh, two points. Uh, first one, um, based on the Stanford instrument that we examined, I found it refreshing to be able to offer faculty the opportunity to have some input um, and customize the questionnaire. I feel like uh, it has a lot of benefits, not without their drawbacks. And the second, which relates to the Minnesota uh, evaluation and the North Carolina state, is the notion that uh, have a clear articulation for which stakeholders have uh, which input into the process of evaluating teaching and learning. Uh, I'm not sure that I myself have thought uh, as much about this as I think it deserves to be uh, thought. And I love the analogy of the surgeon uh, reviews and the dining reviews. So thank you. I had a reaction to this. I'm the dean of continuing at the extension school. And it came from what will we actually do with the information? And, and my reaction was I really like the Stanford instrument because it's simple and you're likely to get honest feedback and it'll probably be directionally correct. And then you can parse that. And where you have problems, you can take that small subset of students, know who was in the class, and do a more comprehensive survey where maybe you give them some more incentive to give you detail to truly diagnose the challenges and come up with repairs. So I was putting that practical overlay. I would love to have all the information, Texas that Austin said. We counted like 175 questions. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going to happen, with us, not with human beings taking it. But that's why I kind of like the Stanford approach, a simple entry and then a plan to follow up when you saw something interesting. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed seeing the Minnesota, right, the 360 uh, feedback models, that, uh, ways that we could create kind of communities of practice among faculty and other, other instructors. On the question of how we could do this here, uh, Harvard is the kind of place that often uh, avoids experimentation and iteration if it can't roll out you know, the perfect 100% solution, I think. Uh, well, probably all large institutions are like that. It would be nice to think about ways that you could pilot uh, some of these initiatives on a small scale, right? To take something like a, a portion of the curriculum, maybe the gen ed curriculum or something, and think about ways uh, that at least in that subdivision of the university we could try doing some things like creating these community 360 evaluations, even if we don't yet know if it's the right thing to do for thousands upon thousands of, of students and courses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, kind of next step part of it. One of the things that several people have commented, and I completely agree, that having the opportunity to change or insert things into some of the questions, as was the case at Stanford, is great. I'd like to see uh, whatever appropriate level uh, could be a department, could be a school, a discussion of what those questions might be, because I think many of the faculty might have actually rather radically different examples, even if they're teaching multiple sections of the same course. And that discussion by itself can be quite helpful in getting people to reflect on their teaching. Same table we have. I might just add to that before passing it over to Dustin that um, we've included as many URLs as we could in this material. And it definitely is worth um, browsing around in those because um, 
especially Stanford, has an incredibly robust set of tools and resources around the design of learning outcomes and the flexibility and the creativity involved in that. So each of these schools, this is kind of the tip of an iceberg resting on top of a lot of institutional work that, that bears further look. Hi, Dustin Tingley. Um, this was very helpful, thank you. Um, I was kind of surprised, and maybe you found this in some of your research in this space, about the lack of emphasis on longitudinal data. Um, so for example, a systematic university-wide midterm evaluation of courses the, doesn't have to be as long or as complicated or anything. Um, because otherwise, we're, we're sort of you're getting averages, but you don't know what you what you were starting with, um, and so a midterm evaluation is at least one way, and there's one way to do that, and there are further good pedagogic reasons to do that, anyways. Um, but I guess I'm not aware of any school that is systematically doing that across all its classes, and I've got to wonder why. You know, our teaching and learning centers tell us we should be doing that. We get templates on how to do it, but we don't have a systematic investment to do it, and so I'm just kind of curious. Uh, that raises a similar thing that just came up as, um, you know, I found out, uh, I guess it's an HBS question, but um, actually eliciting um, prior knowledge from students, like, you know, how much prior knowledge did you have? It has that similar flavor of you're trying to have something about the longitudinal sort of direction of a student. Um, so anyways, I think that at the end of the day, that's where the investment, you know, might, might very well be. Yeah, I mean, I think my experience teaching a number of different institutions, I've never had any sort of formalized, systematized midterm evaluations, you know, they encourage you to do things like that, but um, the end, and I don't think we uncovered anything like that in any of the documents. Do you? We weren't looking, because we were looking we at were. summative, you know, to be used for promotion and tenure, then we did. I think the one advantage of the national instruments um, is that they uh, have that kind of a data set. So with the IDEA, you can look semester by semester at a uh, department's courses. Um, and because it's a national data set, you can also see comparisons across peer institutions. Uh, so that, I think that's the trade-off between a homegrown and a national instrument. The national instrument gives you that um, larger infrastructure. They also tend to be the ones with many, many questions, probably for the same reason. So um, one of the things that was a little controversial at the University of Pennsylvania is that they had, um, the students had done a longitudinal analysis by professor over a decade. So the danger of having the data accessible is all the different ways you can slice and dice it. So we are uh, pretty close to time and we don't want to run over. Um, so first of all, I would like to, on behalf of my co-facilitators, thank you all very much for coming, for doing the work that we, uh, <laughs> you didn't know you were signing up for when you signed up for this uh, session. Um, we're glad to hear that you found it valuable. Again, we do have all of the materials and more online, so please feel free to download, peruse, uh, pick at, dissect, adapt. Um, we were very fortunate in being able to find a lot of materials from these institutions. And the last thing that we wanted to leave you with and, and take with you is on the back of your worksheet, you'll notice a set, a set of principles, again, from Stanford, that we thought would be a nice way of just as a parting thought and to tie in with the theme of the rest of the Hilt Conference of, you know, what are the, are there underlying principles at Harvard that we could all agree on that would help us guide our teaching evaluation in whatever form that might be in whichever schools and departments we're in. So we just wanted to sort of leave you with this idea, and I think it echoes what a lot of you said, that while we clearly think evaluating teaching is important, that you know, no one method offers a complete view of that quality. And so how can we arrive at a set of methods and a set of principles that help us measure what we believe is important to us? So. We want to let you get on to your next session. Thank you all very much for your participation. <laughs>